the home of jump racing. This is where the magic happens. Feel like a Cheltenham favourite with Paddy Power. Hello everyone, welcome to Road to Cheltenham and I'm delighted to say that Ruby Walsh is alongside me. I had been expecting to do this show with a special guest but instead Ruby is here and we are going to be focusing as we promised last week on the hurdlers but Ruby there's so much to talk about in terms of hurdling and what happened over the festive period that we're actually going to have to save the novice hurdlers for their own show again next week. Yeah, um, there were so many novices I guess between maidens in Ireland and decent novice performances in the UK that that pretty much is a show of its own. So between the condition hurdlers and a chaser, I think we have a pretty packed show for this week as it is. We certainly do. I think you can probably all guess which that chaser would be. He might just have made his reappearance at Tremor on New Year's Day. But we're going to kick on with the two mile hurdlers. So we're going to start, first of all, uh, with the Matheson hurdle over in Ireland. And it saw Sharjah looking to win the race for an unprecedented fourth time in a row. How did you break this down, Ruby? Because I found this race utterly compelling to watch from start to finish. Yeah, and it was. And to be fair to Gordon Elliott and his team, they knew they'd need a strong gallop for Zana here. So they put in Petit Mouchoir and Felix Deje. Now they jumped out and went a pretty good gallop early on. Felix or Petit Mouchoir made it initially. Felix Deje joined him when they were bypassing what should have been the first hurdle. But by the time they got to the second hurdle, Felix Deje wasn't really doing his job. He jams on, which is no good for a pacemaker. Petit Mouchoir jumps by, but so does St. Roy who is a bit keen with Rachel Blackmore. Now, Rachel gets three parts in front of Davy. She wants to get in front and control the race. Davy Russell's not having it on Petit Mouchoir, and he keeps poking down her inside all the way to what should have been the third was the second. Now, Sal Roy does jump past Petit Mouchoir then, and Rachel gets over onto the railing, but Davy knows the job he's there to do, switches around, goes back up on the outside of Sal Roy, and by the time we get to the fourth hurdle, he's back in front. Now, it was run end to end. There's no doubt about that, which helped Echoes and Rain to settle, but really did st- test Sharjah's stamina. At the sixth hurdle, San Roy jumps on because Petit Mouchoir has won- run his race, but immediately Jack Kennedy ups the ante on Zanna here and goes to join her. Now, Paul Townend slips through on the inside, and Patrick Mullins runs into the back of Petit Mouchoir on the way back and finds himself a couple of lengths off the ones in front, going to the second last where Zana here jumps, or jumps on. Now, Sam Roy ran a really good race because he was quite keen, but now Sharjah has to come round Echoes and Rain, quite wide into the home straight. But Patrick, in fairness to him, times his challenge to get to Zana here perfectly, leaves Zana here in front all the way up to the bypass last hurdle, challenges him as they go and buy it, but doesn't get that far in front of him and only wins by a neck. A great performance, but for me, it was the second and third horse you were taking out of it going forward. Zana here, if you could set, not Zana here, San Roy, if you could settle better. But Zana here, I think he's improved from the Morgiana. He's only four, he's just turned five now. He could have improved again by March. Yeah, let's go back to him in a moment and give the winner his his dues. There was another element of the, the straight as well, wasn't there, in that uh, Jack Kennedy on Zana here, as they bypassed that final hurdle, that gave him a chance to keep Patrick Mullins on Charger out in the chewed up ground. And Charger doesn't like that kind of stuff. It makes his wheels spin. It does a bit. But also, when you say the chewed up ground, it's also the flat track in Nippersdown, which obviously is extensively watered all summer, not unlike Newbury. If you cross the flat track in Newbury compared to the jump track, there's a hell of a difference. So when you get on the middle of Leperstown, it is where the flat racing is. So it is always much slower than left the very inside where the hurdlers race only a couple of times a year and the very outside where the chasers race. The middle of Leperstown is much slower. Now they tell me it's actually not because there's more water put on it, but I think it is. So you also mentioned that key tactical point, which Patrick Mullins has since also reflected on in his uh, racing post column, where um, Zana here sort of slips through on the inside of, of Petit Mouchoir. Um, Echoes of Rain follows him through, but Paul Townend kind of leans out. And where there was room for two, there's only room for one. And Patrick Mullins, he said maybe he was on his phone, ran into the back, <laughs> the back of, Pe- of Petit Mouchoir. That was a, an amazing tactical moment in the race. It was, and it, and it impacted on Patrick's decision then turning in because as you looked at it, and, and I would have, there's no doubt, especially riding, knowing the horse in front of you was a stable companion who looks beaten, 
you would most certainly have gone inside and said, oh, yeah, I'm coming and make sure they didn't knock you down. But Patrick didn't, obviously wasn't trusting Paul Townend because he went round him turning in. He wasn't making that call either. And He wasn't going to make the same mistake twice. No, and they're the split <laughs> second decisions you, you make as, as, as a rider. But um, when I thought coming round, it was a good bit round Echoes and Rain. I thought, oof, that could be the difference. So I... I really like this performance from Charger. I know that on figures it's probably not his best, but given that so much went against him and he still managed to win, and I know he looked, you know, slightly awkward and didn't win by by that far, but I think there were reasons for that. What, what do you think about his credentials in terms of going forward for for Cheltenham now? I look, he's often run badly at the Dublin Racing Festival, the Irish Champion Hurdle, when the hurdle track moves back out. So the outside track in Epperstown doesn't suit him as much as that inside sharp track. We know that. I wouldn't be surprised if he skipped the Irish champion hurdle because his record is poor there and went straight to the champion hurdle. And maybe going there, a fresher horse might bring about a different result for him. It may not. Honeysuckle on every bit of form we know has the holding of Sharjah. And even last spring, when she underperformed in Punchestown, she still managed to beat him. She's just better than him. She's exceptional. And I think he's a good horse. Yeah, I agree. So he now is a four-time winner of the Matheson Hurdle. Of course, Isterbrack has done that and Hurricane Fly as well, but not in consecutive years. For his last three successes, you were on board Hurricane Fly. Uh, I know that people hate, particularly jockeys hate having horses being compared, but how would you compare the two, Ruby? I think Patrick summed that up in his own interview straight after the race uh, when he spoke glowingly about Sharjah but didn't dare put him in the same bracket as Hurricane Fly and definitely not his to bracket. Yeah, I 100% agree with that. Right, let's go back to Zana here, because like you, I'm really taking with him. I know you and I both liked him for the Triumph Hurdle last season. But, you know, there was a first time tongue tie. The race probably didn't pan out as he wanted. He's clearly a very strong stayer at two miles and could probably get further. But he's improved with every run this season. Yeah, he has. And in a sense, Lydia reminds me slightly of, of our Connor. Um, I hope he's a luckier horse than our Connor was. Um, but when our Connor at Leperstown was well beaten by Hurricane Fly and Jet Ski, come the Irish champion hurdle, he'd gotten much closer to Hurricane Fly and Jet Ski. And he was obviously travelling really well when he sadly fell and and, and um, broke his neck in the champion hurdle. So, um, you know, it's four year olds can improve mm. as they turn five through the spring of the year. And Zana here would look like the horse that's open to the improvement. Comparative to Sharjah, I think he's too big. Um, I mean, Appreciated is currently second favourite for the champion hurdle. And I don't think he's earned that. I think Sharjah has earned that, that position. And I don't think Zana here should be as big comparatively as, as he is to Sharjah. No, I, I would agree. Um, that said, if Appreciated lines up, he's the runaway winner of last year's Supreme. He will obviously be the biggest biggest threat. But look, he has the line up for, for that mm. to happen. Yeah, he's got to get there, hasn't he? After yeah. that, after the the setback. Um, you mentioned Sanwa. What for? I'd say he's too high for the county. I, I would still think the champion hurdle. It was his first run of the season. Everything else in the field that counted had had a run. Um, and I thought it was a much better performance for him. He did over race in the first mile of the race, uh, a bit fresh and gassy, but he jumped much more like the horse we saw winning the county. And um, I'd say it was a step forward for him. You saw what I was angling at. I was wondering whether you were thinking County because he's still slightly lower than Arctic Fire was when he won the race, albeit I know Arctic Fire had finished second to Faheen a couple of years earlier in the championship. Mm. Yeah, it depends. I, I think Arctic Fire was a bigger horse than San Roy. And I don't know if San Roy got the actual physical size to carry. I know he's going to carry the same weight in the champion hurdle, but carrying top weight and the handicap, giving all that weight away. He just doesn't strike you as the individual that's big enough to do that. That's me probably thinking rather old fashioned. We show sure figures and uh, stats and things like that would prove that's absolute waffle. Echoes in rain. What is Willie Mullins going to do with her now? Because she's so keen. You would think something like the mare's herd or going up and trip can't be her bag. No, she's a home rating of 142 ish. I'd say that's a handicap mark myself. Yeah, and she, that she might be able to to find a race in which she can settle. So yeah. that might be she set, she settled well in in Leperstown. That was her second run, and she was the same last year. From being very keen in her early runs, the more runs she had, the more she settled. 
Right, so that was the Matheson hurdle and uh, Sharjah uh, has won his fourth. Then meanwhile, over at Kempton, we have the Christmas hurdle. And first off, we're going to get a handle on, Ruby, how the race was run comparatively to another J.P. McManus-owned horse, uh, a novice hurdler, Broomfield Berg, who ran in the first race. Yeah, look, same track, same day, same distance. So it's easy to put them side by side and see where you end up. Um, look, they start at the same time. You get to the first hurdle, they're pretty much together. There's not much of a difference between the novice on your left and Epitant, not so sleepy on your right. Same with the second hurdle. But by the time they get around the bend and go down to the fourth hurdle away from the stands, Epitant, not so sleepy, are in front of the novice hurdle, which you would expect the grade one to be going quicker than the novice. But by the time they get to the third last, which is the sixth hurdle, Epitant, not so sleepy, they're well clear. The whole field is well clear of the novice hurdle. So they run quickly down the back straight, around into the home straight, up to the second last. Epitant et al. are still well clear of Broomfield Berg when they jump the second last. Now Epitant quickens away, the others begin to tire, as does Broomfield Berg begin to quicken up in his race. Time to jump the last, he's eaten into the ground of the, of the grade one hurdle race. And at the line, well, Bloomfield Berg, would have finished just beside Tritonic and Not So Sleepy if you ran the same race. Uh, well, Theoretically. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> obviously, because uh, Broomfield Berg basically bossed inferiors, and no doubt we'll talk about him next week. But focusing on the Christmas hurdle, and we'll look at the start in more detail later, but um, Not So Sleepy and Epitant had dead-heated in the fighting fifth ruby, and here Not So Sleepy was simply not in the same mood, and Epitant brushed him to one side. Yeah, I mean, look, you could obviously not so sleepy's demeanor was the biggest was the biggest difference and that's quite apparent by the time you get to the third hurdle because Epitant jumps right up beside him and again at the fourth hurdle when she gets tight she still lands beside him and she's always going easier than him now when they get into the back straight to the fifth hurdle I think it was Epitant wings it and she already has Tritonic who'd won at Ascot sort of struggling and away from the third last Tritonic and Soaring Zori are both at it and she just quickens away then to the second last and she's always going to win. Nico lets her go a bit to her left at the last, and she wins really impressively. I think it was more like the Epiton that we had seen in the past. Her jumping was quick, it was slick, and she was just too good for her rivals. But you can also argue not so sleepy didn't turn up. I wasn't so impressed as you from the sound of things by Epitant. I thought, I mean, her hurdling was definitely better. She looked back to her old slick self, but... As she turned for home into the straight, I thought she was going to go away and win easily. But in the end, she didn't. I mean, she's she's slowing down quite markedly. I mean, she had they have gone a good pace in the mid part of the race. But she hasn't beaten Glory and Fortune, who made quite a serious error at the second last, and Soaring Glory, both of whom are the her inferiors by that far. For me, it, it wasn't the kind of performance that I was hoping for. Um and I, I just feel that her, I, I might have overestimated her form when she was on song in the 2019-2020 season. Yeah, or maybe she's just um, declined from there either, Lydia. Um, you know, maybe she hasn't scaled those heights again since. But I did, did, I did think she ran strongly through the middle part of the race, whereas um, Stan Shepard and Dorian Fortune, he didn't take part. Yeah. Um, he let them at it. It was a great ride from him. He never get much praise for a losing ride. He rode to pick up the pieces and as many pieces as he could, and he finished second. I thought it was a great ride from him. He just didn't get involved in that. He didn't try to chase Epitant and not so sleepy in the back straight, whereas Tritonic and Soren Glory did. Yes, and Tritonic, maybe it was a quick appearance from Ascot. Maybe he's just not this class. So, what are you expecting of Epitant now? Uh, afterwards, both Nicky Henderson and JP McManus seemed to feel that the important thing was winning half the fighting fifth and winning the Christmas hurdle they kind of already seemed resigned to defeat against Honeysuckle do you think that's fair because I do I think it's realistic yeah yeah okay right so I mentioned that we're going to have a, a closer look at the start and that's because this is Ruby Walsh's analyze this section so this week for analyze this we're going to analyze the start of a hurdle race now we could have picked either hurdle races from Kempton or Leperstown that had controversial starts. Not so much controversial, but where things happened. And we're going to pick the one where the jockeys could have reacted to the actions of a horse. Whereas at Leperstown, they could do nothing about it. At Kempton, they could have done something about not so sleepy. And as we watch them walking into the start, and you keep your eye on the starter's flag and the tape, you can see not so sleepy. He doesn't really want to line up. Johnny Burke is having to root him in the guts, give him a squeeze. 
give him a kick, nick on the bundles in front on the white cap on Epitant, flag drops, tape goes back, not so sleepy, plants himself. A very sporting gesture from the other riders in the Christmas hurdle to wait for not so sleepy. He was, or is the horse of dead heat in the triumph in the fighting fifth. He was a danger. I would have left him at the start, but very sporting from the others. From Nico de Boinville's point of view, it's the first time he'd ridden Epitant in public because Aidan Coleman was suspended. He mentioned after the race that uh, the race didn't go to plan tactically. Um, he would have had instructions clearly to get a lead, wouldn't he? Oh, he would. But the other side of that coin is uh, not so sleepy was his biggest danger. So when he plans himself, if he bucks off, you can be full short connection of thinking happy days. We've left the biggest danger at the start. Is the flip side of that coin? It is. I mean, you know, you, you you will have been placed in that position when you were riding yourself, when you've had to make a unilateral decision instantly at that moment. It's it's easier the more I suppose the more familiar you are with the role. When you're, it, it, it's more difficult, surely, when you're substituting for somebody on a on on a high profile horse like Epitant. Oh, of course it is, but. It's always easy to apologise for a mistake if you've made the decision with the right intentions. And that would have been the decision made with the definitely the right intentions. And if it backfired, then so be it. Now, it didn't matter. Epitaph still went and won the race. Um, but I would be a believer that if you make a decision for the right reasons, most people will forgive you quickly. <laughs> So let's continue with the two mile hurdlers at the same time as Sharjah was winning at Lepasan on the day, same day anyway. Uh, Quilixios ran into Tihupu again at Limerick. Uh, the race was between the two of them from, from quite a way out, Ruby. How did you see it? I think we're trying to find um, two mile hurdlers, Lydia, to tell you the truth. Look, this is a race run at, at No Gallop. Tihupu ended up making the run on the Jordan Gain for Calixius at second. Trying to get to the fourth hurdle, still the same positions. Three out, Calixius jumps up and joins Tihupu. And then down the hill, Daryl O'Keefe is trying to hang on to Calixius all the way down. But Limerick is almost an environment of its own at Christmas time. Really testing ground. And even though they're in a long way, horses don't finish there. And Daryl lets Calixius run to the second last. Flies it, pass like run past the two point, flies the second last. He looks home for all money, gets a bit high in the, in the air at the last. Tihupu lands galloping and outstays Calixius. To me, Tihupu is the strongest there. Calixius is a faster horse. I read them champion hurdle horses. I don't. Okay, well, we'll see what the two of them do during the rest of the season. Let's move on to Darva Star. Now, <laughs> he, of course, has already finished placed in the champion hurdle behind Epitant in 2020 when he was eight years of age. He was a bit of a slow developer, and last season he tried fences. It didn't go that well, even though he started with a win. And initially over Christmas Ruby, Gavin Cromwell had intended to run him over three miles in a handicap chase with first time blinkers, but it didn't go well. No, it didn't. And that's what he tried. Uh, lined up in the Paddy Power. He got a great start in the Paddy Power handicap chase. He's just behind the front rank, heading to the first fence. You're a bot. Jig is down with the yellow cap and um, maroon colours. He tips up and all bar brings Starver Star down. Uh, brings it to a complete standstill. It also, um, and you know, and Keith Donahue did the right thing. He jumps a couple of more fences, but by the time he gets to the fourth fence, he's stone last and he's tailed off, and he just pulls him up. His race was over. But then Gavin reversed the hurdles and goes back to Punchestown with him, which I think he's much happier at anyway. Um, and you watch him go into the first hurdle. Keith Assembly had beaten him over fences at Thurless, but Darvish Star is tracking him right behind him. Third hurdle, Darvish Star is jumping, whereas we've watched him losing going over fences. He's not losing any over hurdles. The fourth hurdle, even Keith Dunne, who's taking him back. By the time he gets to the sixth hurdle, he joins Keyless Emery. Three out, Darvish stars galloping over Keyless Emery. And off the home turn down to the last hurdle, he moves effortlessly clear and absolutely hoses up. Now, distance is the question for Darvish Star the day. It is. Afterwards, Gavin Cranwell was talking in terms of the Boyne and the Galmoy, so two, five and three miles. So it might be that he's going to be trying stable, staying hurdle tri type trips. Yeah, and look, the way he went to the line of Punchestown and tested ground, albeit in a race that was well below grade one standard, he looked comfortable. He yeah. obviously had thought he was going to stay because he ran him in the paddy power. Um, and he looks a much happier horse jumping hurdles. 
Yeah, and it was great to see him looking happier. Um, now, we head to Musselburgh on New Year's Day next. And this was a horse that um, I was trying to argue into the show at, a, at an earlier stage. You wouldn't have it. I'm, I'm insisting this time, Ruby. I'm insisting that we include Tommy's Oscar for um, Anne and Ian Hamilton. And first of all, we're going to contextualise what he did up against a juvenile, as we're going to be picking up the juveniles later on in the show. Um, Inca Prince won the opening juvenile contest and then Tommy's Oscar uh, won a handicap hurdle later on. Yeah, I looked, uh, and you'll see it more so in the juvenile in a while, but down to the first hurdle, Inca Prince, Tommy's Oscar, both the Musselboro, and they get to the first hurdle, they're, they're pretty level. By the time they get to the third hurdle, though, Inca Prince has jumped to the front, and Inca Prince goes really hard then around the bend past the stands in, in Musselboro, and by the time he gets to the fourth hurdle, he's well clear. Now, he's pulled a whole juvenile field in front of the handicap by the time we get to the sixth hurdle, the, the whole field are in front of the handicap hurdlers. But by the time we get to the second last hurdle, Tommy's Oscar is back in front. He's even passed out Inca Prince, jumps the last a few lengths clear of Tommy's Oscar and wins well. Inca Prince would have finished just about fourth in the handicap hurdle, looking at those shots. Yeah, he went a bit too hard, didn't he? But we'll talk about him later. Um, so Tommy's Oscar is um, dangerously looking like the best of, of Britain's hurdlers. I mean, I'm, obviously, Epitom would have her seven pound. Uh, mayor's allowance um and i'm not so sleepy put up a good performance at newcastle and probably head straight to the champion hurdle but tommy's oscar is creeping his way in there he's on a mark of one five six yeah and look um he won really well tom migley rode him the other day and claimed seven off his back and look even if you look at him at the second hurdle lydia he, he's traveling really well he's a strong traveling horse and he gets in tight to the third hurdle but he hurdles it really quickly but by the fourth last this is a uh, wasn't that strongly a run race the whole field is tightly jumped bunched together but by the third last he's loomed up Tommy's Oscar he's low and slick over it and his hands he's way above the opposition at the second last and pulls clear and wins quite easily yeah theoretically he's creeping up the handicap and therefore mathematically is putting himself into the champion hurdle picture now I believe he's going to head up be interesting to see how he gets on yeah, I think he's already shown good enough form to be able to win the champion hurdle trial at Haydock. Whether Cheltenham is going to be his bag, certainly Anne and Ian Hamilton aren't quite sure, are they? They're wondering whether flat tracks would be better suited, but he'd have to stretch out to two and a half miles at Aintree. Maybe the Scottish champion hurdle, where he was apparently below par last season, maybe that would be his kind of race. Yeah, he did win over 2-3, I think, um, at Haydock. But yeah, I think Anne Hamilton has done a good job with Tommy's Oscar three on the bounce if she can win the Haydock champion hurdle trial with him I'd say that's a pretty good season for Tommy's Oscar she's done a great job full stop I mean I think they've only run six horses this season and um four of them have won I'm pretty sure um there's Nutswell the veteran who's you know a, a high level horse there's pay, pay, the, uh, pay the Piper the novice chaser I mean they do incredibly well with a small string and I think they need a, a proper shout out give it to them <laughs> I have done this the, let, let, let this be the shout out but what do we think, Ruby, serious face now, about the state of, of two-mile hurdling? If we're talking about, you know, Tommy's Oscar, with no no offence to him whatsoever, moving into being a candidate for the champion hurdle, certainly from the British point of view, still a long way off, obviously, the standard set by Honeysuckle and Sharjah. But, you know, Honeysuckle is eight, Sharjah is nine. It, it, the division is pretty thin. What do you think's going on here? Uh, what is going on? Um, what won last year? Supreme appreciated. He'll probably, by default, looks like he might line up in this year's champion hurdle. Bob Olga won the Valley more. He's gone chasing. Um, I don't know what's going on. I, I think it's like everything, Lydia. It comes and fits and starts. And it just looks to be a shallow division right now. But it doesn't take long to turn around. You only need three decent novices to make it a proper rest. I mean, I like, I really like your optimism, but I'm worried that there's a more underlying long-term problem. Do you think that connections who buy horses that are proven in the point-to-point -point field, who might have otherwise have run in bumpers, are more inclined to go chasing rather than hurdling with a the horse these days? Yeah, look, it looks that way, apart from the obvious one, which is only something you yeah. came from the point-to-point -point field. Um, you know, Fahim was a point-to-pointer. There's two pretty recent champion hurdle winners that ran in point to point. So um, I don't necessarily think so. Probably more the amount of horses that are being exported for the Melbourne Cup or for Australia as in stairs, that probably is having a bigger impact on it. But it's also what, what are people buying? And the bloodstock agents 
trainers to bloodstock agents, they surely realise that there's an opening and that's the kind of horse they should be buying. He saw the juvenile at Gordon's winning at Punchestown on New Year's Eve, came out of John Gosling's for 200 and whatever amount of thousand. I, I, there's one that could have went to Australia. So, mm. you know, someone has spotted that there's a, a gap in the market there. And look, that's what bloodstock agents are there for. You had to go to 220,000 guineas in order to secure Pie Piper, though. And, you know, it, I can understand going to what Australia. Would the, what, would a good, what would a good point of pointer cost you? The classic getaway that runs that run into Ryan and Clamwell today. Well, what did he cost? I mean, uh, the price of horses is, is, is going in one direction. Um, so competing at a quarter of a million, that's what you have to do. I'm worried about the exodus of um, staying types to the likes of Australia um, in the horses and training sales at the back end of the sort of three year old season. That these kind of horses that might well end up over over uh, in the two mile herding division are decreasingly being actually bred. And I think there's actually a structural or fundamental problem. And I think about this division and I think about the, the classic era lot of late 60s into early 80s, the likes of, you know, Night Nurse, Monksfield, Persian War, Comedy of Errors, Lanzarote, you know, Bird's Nest, Beulah, you know, uh, Sea Pigeon. These are horses that are part, are part of the history. I mean, this division was was the uh, a household name, the horses in this division um, in that era. And then we had the likes of Brave Inca, Max Joy, Harchibald, Rooster Booster, Hardy Eustace, taking each other on during the course of the season. And while, while not one of those was ever absolutely brilliant, like Isabrak, um, it was still a level of competition, regular competition during the course of the season, which I don't think we've had for a, for a very long time. Pickle <laughs> Oh, God, I hope you're right. Now, we mentioned at the start of the show that we would be talking about Album Photo and the return of the dual Gold Cup winner. It was a belated return, really, because Willie had been hoping to run the horse earlier, but the faster ground hasn't really let him. So it's back for the fourth time to the Savile's New Year Day chase at Tremor, facing three stable companions. What did you make of this? Not a whole pile. Um, he was supposed to go to Torles, um in the middle of November, but obviously he couldn't go there. Um, look, he sat behind Acapella Bourgeois, Boris Saint followed him Bramble Bull sat last. They're going a nice gallop early, Lydia, but by the time they get back to where they started, going to about the sixth fence, Acapella Bourgeois is already beaten. Um, Boris Saint is quite keen right behind them. And when they pass up by the winning post after jumping the eighth fence, they're absolutely hacking. They were going so slow. Um, he puts down at the ninth, then he wings the tenth fence. Um, you know, but even watching them away from the eleventh, Boris Saint and Bramble Bull who are stairs, are quite keen behind him. So he didn't look like he went that fast. The 12th fence, he hit it a good wrap. He got in tight to the 14th. And then it was a sprint from the bottom of the hill. Now, all the way down the hill, I'm thinking, oh, Boros said is running away behind Brahma Bull. Mm. If he flies the second last, Brian Hayes will get at him. But in fairness to Album Photo, he, he quickened better and Brahma or Boros said kept going up and down the one spot. Brahma Bull finished third. It was a two furlong dash. Um, I was expecting to see a lot more, to tell you the truth, but he won the race, he ran in, and they went really steady. For me, it was a really unsatisfactory race. I know that Acapella Bourgeois couldn't really go, but the other two, Brahma Bull and particularly Burrow Saint, were they too deferential to Album Photo? Deferential as in what? What do you mean by deferential? I mean, allowing allowing it, it all 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 his own well, Paul Tannen and Album Photo all, all, all their own way. That, you know, they they had... did allow him all his own way. Um, I, Brahma Bull probably couldn't... I don't think he's good enough to win around that kind of track anyway. He's a strong staying horse. I don't think he'd have won whatever way you And I thought Brian, said, Brian Hayes even Rob Burrow saying to have one dash at Album Photo, but Album Photo was too quick for him. I don't think there's any given day that Bram or Bola Burrow Saint are going cup horses. They never are, never have been. Um, whereas Album Photo is, I think they looked at it tactically and known for the sprint, but the go cup horse won the sprint. For me, it was unsatisfactory because the other two were were race fit, and uh, you know, Boris Saint was a bit slow to get after our album photo two out. But you know, we we we, we differ. Um, we I differ. Think I don't think, and I just listen that reading the running order here, where someone says borrow a uh, album around seventy five percent fit. He was ready to run at Torless in November. I'd say album photos a good bit straighter this year than he was last year. 
So afterwards, uh, but first of all, where would you rank this performance compared with his other three wins? I don't think it was anywhere near as good as the previous. No, but it wasn't anywhere near a strong race. Um, and even his the first year I won in him was a really strong race. We look back at the form of that. Um, but no, I don't think it was. I, I tipped him at 16 to 1. I don't think he did his credentials any harm for the Gold Cup. Um, but I think he won a race that wasn't even run to suit him. Okay, well, um, people have been suggesting that you are um, C at S. Um, that was uh, our very own Nick Luck. Well, we like an initialism on this show. Uh, clutching at straws with your 16 to 1, um, Richard Hogan was su suggesting. Uh, he thought that he could get beaten for a stride, which would indicate that he needs to improve from the run, but he thinks he will. Um, Burroughs place placed in a Grand National. Brahma Bill um, was uh, well beaten in the Ladbrokes Trophy, albeit finishing third. The bear form is form. And I don't think there's enough improvement to win a Gold Cup. Maybe first three um, wasn't impressed. And he thinks that Ruby's clutching at straws, as he said that Nick Luck said. And Nick pointed out that the C at S comment came from Jane Mangan. Yeah. 16 to 1 was each way, wasn't it? He never said each way at the time. Are you retrospectively? No, no, each no. Way? Um, but I was. Maybe that's just my mentality. 16 to 1 is an each way price in my eyes. Willie Mullins afterwards was talking about struggling to get another race because he does, does want to get another race into him prior to the Gold Cup. So he asked the roadies, where should Album Photo next run to prepare for his bid in the Cheltenham Gold Cup? 47% went for the Irish Gold Cup, 25% for the Thaistis chase, which Willie counted out. I quite like a Thaistis angle. That's what I voted for. And 23% said uh, a Willie Mullins race course gallop, which Willie himself was talking about manufacturing I mean 23% of Road to Cheltenham viewers would rather have album photo running in a race course gallop than running in an actual race if you are one of the 23% just switch off now go away there's nothing for you here nothing for you here at all you know why don't we just do away with races and have a public vote or a panel of people who can just vote on which horse is the best uh, Ruby where should <laughs> where should album photo go next Ooh. Uh, where should he go next <sighs> I'd say if the ground was soft enough, probably the Irish Gold Cup, if you're going to run them again. Um, That's a big fact, though, isn't it? I mean, both Willie Mullins and Gordon Elliott have made comments about the ground for the for the Dublin Racing Festival. It's, it's, yeah. it's political comments that, you know, there, there seems to be a bit of angst behind the scenes here and not even behind the scenes anymore. <laughs> yeah, no, look, it would have to be soft enough for the Irish Gold Cup. Um, would I run them in the test days off top weight? Probably not. Um, he could run him in the Bobby Joe as well he mm -hmm. qualified for that and as regards the race course gallops I just go back to what we always did with them tell no one they're even happening no one's any wiser they're going on since Adam was a boy yeah I'd rather I mean always would rather a race Michael Hall thinks Thaisties soft ground will ease the trainer's furrowed brow um, the bonus is seeing a top class horse in the handicap I agree Michael and Charlie Aston suggests the new, new two mile six furlong £150,000 chase at Lingfield um, albeit I know that um, Willie Mullins doesn't really want to travel the horse over to Britain ahead of the Gold Cup. And he also thinks that the Grand Steeple chase in Paris afterwards would be nice to see him after Cheltenham and Punchestown. What do you make of those apples? Yeah, Grand Steep's a good call. Um, but I do think to win the Grand Steep, you probably need to um, have it as your target. You won't win it as an afterthought. So let's take a look at the impact on the Gold Cup betting. 10 to 1 now, Albion Photo, Ruby. You've moved markets. Yeah, I think a lot. I think the performances of other horses moved the markets there, yeah. <laughs> um, we had the entries for the Gold Cup, the Ryanair and the Queen Mother Champion Chase this week. Um, no huge surprises. If we start with the, the Gold Cup, which wasn't a, a particularly big field, relatively small. We've got a couple of novices in there in a hoist and your and run wild Fred. We've got Mount Ida, who won that mare's chase at Fairy House over the New Year period. And Angel's Breath, who won both of his starts at Ascot as a novice chaser back in the 19. Uh, 2019 2020 season we haven't seen him since any thoughts not a whole pile no um didn't think a high senior jump well enough at Kempton don't think one wild Fred is good enough um and Mount Ida was game but be surprised too yeah Gordon Elliott was talking more in terms of the mayor's chase at Cheltenham and Mrs Paddy Power but also the Grand National he'd had earmarked as the long-term target for this season a protector at Rated 164 is the best of British. There's only one winner in the past 15 years that's been rated lower than 168. That winner is, Ruby? Lower than 168. Yeah. 
the worst Gold Cup winner in the past 15 years. Lord Windermere. But yeah. You see, instantly. I was about to apologise to all involved with, with, with the horse, but you got it instantly. Um, and other, other bits of information. No Frodon. Um, these days, he's not quick enough for the, the Ryanair. He doesn't like and stay well enough for the, for the Gold Cup. Put the kettle on is in the Ryanair. Editor de Gite has been entered in the Queen Mother Champion Chase. And Sham Blue, who was so unfortunate in the Charlie Hall, he's only in the Ryanair. Not too many surprises there. No, absolutely. So um, those are the entries so far for Cheltenham next week. The major hurdle races will be able to look over those engagements. So now we move on to the staying and I suppose intermediate distance hurdlers and we head over for another Christmas hurdle and analyse another start. Uh, this is for the Dawn and Engineering one at Leopardstown. Now this was quite controversial Ruby, Classical Dream surged forward, Flooring Porter was on the outside at the time and had to give belated chase and the rest of them never got into it. Let's talk about the start and, and how you, you saw it. Let's first of all talk about their relative behaviour of the two principles in the beforehand. You talk memorably about Classical Dream being fast in his head and he was showing some signs of that beforehand, wasn't he? Yeah, he was. And he's notorious for doing it, caused a false start in the Supreme. Flooring Porter did it in the Liz Mullen where he caused a false start by charging forward. And he did charge off going to the start to punch sound as well. So both horses have it within their remit to do what they did at the week uh, last week. Now, when the tape goes, it looks like Classical Dream flies forward, but to Danny Mullins' defence, the flag hadn't dropped at the same time as the tape went. So he's not expecting it to be a start. Paul Townend reacts and capitalises on it and lets Classical Dream go. And he's poached, when you run the start, he poached eight to ten lengths on Florian Porter, who moves immediately into second place and the rest of the field are left behind. Now, the time we get to the first hurdle, Classical Dream was four lengths in front and Florian Porter was caught up with him going to the second. But it was an advantage. He never really got back, did he? So there was no full start. The race went on. And afterwards, of course, there was a steward's inquiry at which the starter, Joe Banahan, gave his evidence. Paul Townend gave his evidence. And um, in a sentence I particularly enjoyed from the inquiry, Fiery report. Um, Danny Mullins on board Flooring Porter stated that the uh, video recordings were self explanatory. Um, the stewards came to the conclusion um, that the starting procedures were adhered to. Um, had they concluded that the start was manifestly unfair, I suppose they'd have had to have avoided the race, wouldn't they? That's about the only thing, conclusion you could come to. So, um, yeah, were they going to avoid the race? Probably not. Did Classical Dream gain an advantage? Oh, I think he did, and I'm in the close Sutton camp, but my reading of the rule is there's one word in there that says simultaneously, means the flag and the tape must go simultaneously. I could be wrong, but what I looked at, they didn't look simultaneous. I agree. They clearly weren't. And I've been very kindly sent pictures by the Irish Horse Racing Regulatory Board, some stills, which show that the tape... Um, was clearly the button was pressed to release the tape at the same time as Classical Dream surged forward. I, I can definitely see that. But the flag came down a little bit later. It, it, it's quite a lot for humans to expect both of those things to happen simultaneously, don't you think? It, it is. And I think if you're being realistic about it without VAR, how do you change it? What do you do? And you're not going to bring that in. Um, the Classical Dream... He nailed it, just got it, <laughs> he nailed it himself, um, but he did poach a, a considerable advantage. But look, the results stood, that's the way it is, and it's a, a rematch we look forward to. But look, even if you, you go back into the race, did you? And look, when them get to the fifth hurdle, they're, they're, the two in front are well clear of the remainder. Sam Profile on seat, Satan Coleman. At the sixth hurdle, Saldia makes a mistake, he's pulled up. And away from the eighth hurdle, both Ronald Pump and Sire de Burley are starting to struggle. At the ninth hurdle, the, the floor Porter and classical dream are well clear of burning victory. Now, with turning into the third last, the field has closed up. Abacadabra, burning victory. They've closed up on floor Porter and classical dream are still in front. And at the second last, you're thinking, oh, are the ones behind going to get the ones in front? But no, it's the opposite. Classical dream starts to quicken, floor Porter follows them and they pull clear of burning victory. Classical dream jumps the last well and he holds floor Porter. It was a really good performance from Classical Dream on his seasonal debut to make all and go a strong gallop. Even if he did poach a head start, none of the rest of the field ever got involved. 
Yeah, I think I suppose I might argue that ideally there might have been a full start, but in the end, I think everybody can comfort themselves from the fact that classical dream didn't go out there and dawdle in front, you know, didn't take advantage in that kind of way of the of the start that he got. He set some good, strong fractions and he is worth every bit of that success, I think. And funnily enough, if they'd all started together, I still think the result would have been the same. Yeah, I, I actually think, um, and even listening to Paul, Classical Dream may well have settled a little better behind Florian Porter and it might have suited him better. So, um, look, it, it was a good performance and I agree. They weren't simultaneous. There could have been a false start, but when there wasn't, what were you going to do? How do you see it as regards Cheltenham? If we have a look at the Paddy Power stay, Sayers Hurdle betting, Classical Dream is now the 11-4 to favourite. Champ, the winner of the Long Walk Hurdle just before Christmas, is 9-2 to two, and Florian Porter is 6-1. to one. How do you see that? Yeah, I, it's probably fair. I mean, you're entitled to think the classical dream is going to improve for that run and therefore it's going to be hard for Florian Porter to get by him. But the Florian Porter connections will be thinking, well, we're not going to give him a 10 length head start in Chatham, so maybe we will. Do you think he looks more and more quirky though, Florian Porter? I mean, he's hanging quite a bit in the closing stage. I know he never gives up behind classical dream, but and I feel all... like his quirks are more foreground than they were. I know he always has been. No, I watched him all of the summer of 2020. Um, in handicap hurdles, and he's always looked looked quirky. I could never believe he scaled the heights he did, but he has, and he has a big engine. Whilst we're talking about the stayers hurdle, I just want to throw uh, three Willie Mullins horses at you and ask you whether you think they might get an entry next week. Um, Kenboy, maybe in headgear, Melon, which I think Willie Mullins has hinted anyway, and Asterian Forge. I said they could all get entries, um, but entries in Claw Sutton are a completely <laughs> different team to a declaration. <laughs> Oh, I think we know that. I think we know that. Right, looking further back in the backwash of the Christmas hurdle, Burning Victory, I expected her at one point that she was going to come out at the pack and give chase. And I just wonder whether she was fully effective in the latter half of the race. I was thinking there's hurdle for her. Yeah, I'd agree. Um, I don't know if she really stayed, but she jumped better than she has done in the past. And I think the run in the Galway hurdle will eventually stick to her um, or stand to her even experience wise. Um, but look, yeah, she ran a really solid race because she had to, I suppose lead the lead the chase um, in the back straight and pay the penalty for that late on, but it was still a, a really good run for her. I've put her up at sixteen to one for the Close Brothers Mayor's Hurdle at the Cheltenham Festival with um, Paddy Power in the column. I think she could run really well. Slight concern about the old course as as opposed to the new course in which she ran um, won the Triumph Hurdle. Fortunately, um, when it really should have been Goshen. Um, how about Abacadabras? Uh, what do you think of him? He looked like a total non-stayer to me. Yeah, he's been disappointing this year. Um, it was an old show in Ferry House over two and a half. Um, maybe he didn't stay in Leperstown, but he never showed in the race either. Um, I think it's back to the drawing board with him, really. And I was really disappointed with Cy de Burley. Yeah, and I was disappointed how early he was struggling. Exactly. So far out. Um, really, he was looks to, like he's regressed a bit as well. Another headgear switch, maybe, might salvage something? Yeah, possibly, but... Um, I don't know. You just need something to, to rekindle a bit of spark. OK, let's move on to the Relkill hurdle, shall we, on New Year's Day. And uh, another weekend, another race won by Danny Mullins over in Britain. This time it was on Stormy Island. He controlled the race in the front. However, there were two upsides at the last. Stormy Island on the inside and brewing up a storm who took a tumble, sadly. Yeah. And look, even if you, if you, if you play the race, like Stormy Island booked out in front, as you said, and got to dictate the race. It drove to the fourth hurdle though, and they're all pretty close to closely grouped. Even though Danny's in front, she makes a slight mistake. And on the blind side is the only one that you wouldn't really want to be on. Down to the second last, Levant is uh, Don Levant is gone. Garda Dreams is starting to struggle. Three come to the four off the bend. Mike Fabulous gets out paced crossing the road. Stormy Island goes at it with brewing up a storm. It's six to one half a dozen, and the other going to the last, which one is going to win? Brewing up a storm doesn't take off, crashes through the hurdle, and it leaves Stormy Island to come home. Um, a good performance from her, um, a nice race to win with her, and she'll obviously go for the Mayor's Hurdle too. Yes, which she's run well in a couple of times, but never yet managed to win. Is there any reason to think that she can this time around at the age she is? I don't think she's going to face a Honeysuckle or a Benny Did You in this year's renewal, and that would definitely be a head to her. Yes, and perhaps maybe she's a little bit more consistent than, than she was. Although maybe the mayor she was beating at Ferry House and Punchestown had either gone to Cheltenham or were tired from Cheltenham when she ran into them. I, I'd say so, but I, I just don't think it's been a, 
um, a really strong race in the past. I don't think last year's renewal was outstanding, and I'm not mm-hmm. sure this year's is either. It doesn't look to be a, a, an outstanding mayor like a, a Quivig or a Benny the Jew, Vumag, any power. Yeah. You know what I mean? Honeysuckle, Lapples, Jade. There's no one of those mayors there. Yeah, I, I think I think that's fair. I think it's all, all up, uh, up to play for. Um, Brewing up a storm and McFabulous will be heading to the National Spirit probably and uh, Don Levon, I, I've got my eye on Don Levon. He's still quietly improving, I think, and he wasn't best position there and made a mistake at the second last. I'm bearing him in mind for something. Right, let's move on to uh, the Mayor's Hurdle at Leopardstown over Christmas. Now, this was a really interesting race. Heaven help us, a bit like she did in the Coral Cup when winning at the festival last season, took them along and it was a deep, packed field. Yeah, it was. Look, and she booked out and went to... I don't think she went that good a gallop. Um, Danny was was steady enough in front of her, jumped the first well. Third hurdle, the favourite she wears as well, makes an awful mistake. And then she part, goes at the fourth. She lost her confidence, stood way too far back at the fourth hurdle and crashed out and broke her nose. So hopefully she'll be okay. Then at the sixth hurdle, early in the back straight, Royal Kahala, she's a little grab at that. And at the second, seventh hurdle, heaven help us, is really quick compared to Royal, Hala, Royal Kahala just behind her. But at two out, it's still a tightly packed field. Heaven help us is in front, Royal Kahala's in the second rank. And tell me something, girl, is sneaking into her from the back. But as you play it into the home straight, Kevin Sexton keeps tell me something, doesn't keep her in, but doesn't leave a gap for tell me something hard to get out. So she doesn't get running until late. He jumps the last well on Royal Kahala and mows down help and help us with tell me something girl staying on well from the back. It was a big jump forward from tell me, tell me something girl, but I did know Peter Fahey and Kevin Sexton's comments about Royal Kahala. They think she wants the ground so, even softer than it was last week. And they do believe soft ground is key to her. Yes, and that that's the minimum trip and that ultimately she'll do well as a chaser and maybe over further. And they were sort of talking about not necessarily going to Cheltenham unless the ground was soft enough. Whereas Tell Me Something Girl, well, she was conceding weight all around there. And if we have a look at the betting, I quite like her at 13 to 2. Um, you can get her at 13 to 2 in a place. You can also get her widely at 6 to 1. Um, and I think that that was a really good performance. As you explained, things didn't quite go her way. She's already a Cheltenham Festival winner and she'll be meeting all of these mares on level terms in March. Yeah, Nancy, you want to back in that race? Yeah, <laughs> well, <laughs> says you. you. You told me you can back two in a race. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, two so far. You um, picked I, me up on it, so I'm only picking you up. <laughs> I, think, I think that's fair. Final section of the show is about the juveniles, and there was plenty of action over the Christmas period. And let's start with a horse that I'm really developing a strong liking for, Ruby. This is Phil Dore, who beat Luna Power, reopposing, he'd beaten him previously, and his stable companion Britska in the Grade Two Knight Frank juvenile at Leopardstown. And the further it went, the more, the more there was to like about it. Luna Power made the run and again, Phil Dore sat second, Britska in the blue colours in the pocket and third, all fine at the first. Second hurdle, field or slightly kind of steps out of it or something, um, but gets away with it quite quickly. Nothing really happened really all the way through, but the sixth hurdle, you can see field or coming to it third last. His, his ears are pricked, he's enjoying himself. And away from the second last, the race is on. And Briska hits it, but field or off the bend is travelling much stronger than Luna Power. And they were much closer together at Ferry House, but field or is all over this. Doesn't jump the last great, lands a bit in all fours, but he comes home and wins causally enough under Davey Russell. Good performance, strong stare. I really like him. There's something about the way he attacks his hurdles when he's meeting them. He wa- he wants to go and jump. Yeah. And often he, he seems to be so malleable and responsive to Davey Russell. And even that's what I meant about the sixth hurdle. You can watch him. He's not in front, but his ears are pricked and he's looking for the hurdle. Um, he likes jumping. Yeah, absolutely. Um, how about um, Luna Power? Could you argue that he might have liked to sound a surface than this and he might be a little bit, little bit better on that? He's got extensive platform, hasn't he? Possibly, possibly. But um, I don't see how he beats Fieldor. Um, I don't know how he turns the form around. Not, no, I, I don't see it either. Uh, but experience can go can can stand to you in the in the, the triumph hurdle, can't it? How about Britska for the Boodles Fred Winter? Possibly. Um, yeah, it would look more realistic. Um, Martin McDowell likes Phil Dore. He's gone back to that conditions event over the extended 14 furlongs that we mentioned earlier on in the season, where he ran into um, in in this world um, over on the west coast of France in early June and uh, based his um, thinks that there's a disparity far too much between the the two horses um, uh, in this world and Phil Dore based on that form. I mean, 
it was their their debut, of course, and uh, I think it's more of a footnote for me that the two of them have met already, rather than anything that I'd be uh, translating over hurdles and uh, from their debut uh, way back then. Let's move on to the Grade One at Chepstow over the Christmas period. This is won by Porticello um, Ruby. It was quite a rough race, and also they didn't have many hurdles to jump. The one in the straight, which would be in the first and the last, was taken out. Yeah, um, but look. We saw that Leperstown too with the sun um, and Porticello. I think he was arguably a better horse than he was at Doncaster. Um, yeah. He stepped forward from it. Um, but, you know, the finale, I don't know, it can be a hard race to, 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 to get a handle on form while he's going forward. I thought San Segal was you know, far too gassy during the course of the race, but he still put up quite a, a good fight against against Porticello. And clearly, forever blessed, you've got to put a line through that because he got chopped up over in the back straight, didn't he, and was never going after that. No, he didn't, but you'd like him to be a bit more robust. It's a long way from home, the back straight in Chepster. Uh, John Mead likes Porticello. He thinks it takes a strong stayer to win the triumph. Um, and Gary Moore deserves recompense. I think everybody would agree with that. Um, and Cormac Wilkowski is thinking about Knight Salute, who I quite like. And this is the horse that beat Porticello at Doncaster. He thinks 14s is massive. Um, Admiral's Pride actually says that he'd prefer him in the Boodles off a mark of 135, a charoud. Uh, let's move on to ICO, shall we? He ran on the second day of Kempton's Ladbrokes Christmas Festival meeting. Um, he was keen enough, but he came home by a wide margin to win for Paul Nichols and Bryony Frost. It does. Where's the hood? Um, rattled down to the first hurdle and let fly. But um, Illico de Place took him on going to the second and watching it on the, the race and TV screen. They're doing 32, 33 miles an hour up past the winning post. They weren't hanging around in this race. Um, good jump from ACO at the third. By the time we get to the fifth hurdle early in the back straight, he's well settled. So the hood, you know, it's obviously doing its job. Um, and they're thinking, are they coming back to the field before they turn in? But in the fairness to ACO, he picks up turning in, lengthens well, flies it at the second last, and having raced fast early, he's doing 33 odd miles an hour on the approach to the last. Um, I thought it was a really good performance from him. I agree. You could see him coming back for the Adonis, couldn't you? Um, Paul yeah. Nichols wasn't that keen on the chart, the chart of Of course, he missed it with Mon Miral last season. Yeah, we'll see what happens, but I thought it was a good performance from this year. Yeah, he won previously at Dieppe, and maybe they could be thinking about something like Aintree. Um, let's move on and talk about Inca Prince. We mentioned him passing before in comparison with Tommy's Oscar. Now, he used to be with Henry de Bromhead. Um, then he went to Cormac Farrell and finished away behind Phil Dorr on his final start before leaving Ireland and joining Ruth Jefferson. Yeah, but um, it's a good performance from him at Musselburgh. Um, now, we've watched him lining up. He was sluggish or slowish to jump off for a keen horse. He doesn't jump off in front, but by the time he gets to the second hurdle, he has pulled his way to the, for to the front, jumps to third. He's rounding the bend in Musselburgh, or heading to the bend, doing 34 miles an hour. He's really um, got the revs up. He's a bit awkward at the fifth. And now when they get to the home turn, you're thinking, oh, they're coming to catch him. He jumps the tree out really well. Second last, Collingham comes to join him. But to be fair to Inca Prince, he pulls away again going to the last and outstays Collingham. Good performance for a horse that ran so hard early. But you'll be thinking flat, he's going to have to have a flat track because if he goes that hard on an undulating track, it's going to be impossible for him. Totally agree. Something like Aintree would be more, much more his bag, but maybe back to Musselburgh uh, later on in, in the year. Interesting you mentioned that sluggish start. He might be on a short fuse. He has once refused to race on the flat. Um, yeah, I just thought it was interesting that a horse that really wants to get on with it was so slow to get into straight. Right, there were a couple of other notable performances over in Ireland that we must discuss. One was Ikar Allen um, at Leopardstown. What did you make of this performance on his debut for Willie Mullins? Decent performance, big field. It gets caught sort of in midfield, mid-pack going to the first hurdle and it gets very tight in front of him. And they pick him up going to the second hurdle then you can see where he's clearly in mid-division. But we turned it ahead on camera into the back straight and see where Mark Walsh has gotten him out to the outside to jump the fourth. A good jump at the sixth puts him into a really good position. And off the home turn then, he arrives going much the best. You think this horse is going to absolutely hose up. Jumps the last fine. But when Mark Walsh, he doesn't sprint, he eventually lengthens to win impressively. Um, a win going away. But from how he looked turning in to how he eventually won, they probably didn't add up. I quite like the way he responded to pressure. I suppose maybe I prefer begrud the begrudging, Ruby. I, I um, thought he was going to absolutely hose up. <laughs> but no, he still won impressively, but I don't know. I'd have to see him again. 
Grant Bradbury likes him. He's intrigued that his win in France was August 2021 and Willie Mullins usually gives his French recruits a little bit more time to settle in. Wonder if he's a bit special and is asking you, you whether have you, do you have any thoughts on that particular point, the fact that he's quick, quick back from France? No, only that he's probably not physically the biggest horse in the world and maybe right. you're making hay before the sun stops shining. Right, yeah, get you. OK, how about uh, New Year's Eve at Punchestan? We saw Pied Piper for Gordon Elliott uh, and Davy Russell have a right tussle with Verbon uh, for Willie Mullins and Paul Townend. Yeah, look, at the first hurdle, uh, Pied Piper is outside Verbon, jumps past him, going to the second hurdle, Davy pulls him back behind Verbon, but again he jumps by, and in the third hurdle he's good, and Davy settles into second place then on Pied Piper with Verbon behind him. Now, when they get around to the sixth hurdle is the first time that they both jump it at parity Pied Piper jumped the first five better than Vauban um, at the second last then Pied Piper makes a mistake Vauban lands, bes- lands beside him they were both good at the second last but after bending into the straight Pied Piper quickens clear now he drifts out to his left Paul Townend goes to the inside Pied Piper goes to his right going to the last Vauban misses has to switch around and fails to get back up Um I thought they pulled a long way clear, Lydia, of the rest of the opposition. I'd say they're two pretty decent horses, but I wouldn't be certain that Pied Piper would always be beat Boban. Yeah, I, I, I tend to agree. Um, they're both pretty pretty smart, though, I suspect. Who do you think we're going to be seeing in the Spring Juvenile at the Dublin Racing Festival? Who's can take another step forward there, do you think, in your view? Um, well, I think Pied Piper and Field Orr are in the same colours, so it'll be interesting if one or other of those line up. Uh, Field door definitely sets the standard. Uh, Pied Piper, it was a good performance the other day, but I wouldn't be surprised if Oban re-opposed them there. So if we look at the uh, JCB Triumph Hurdle betting, Phil Door is the favourite at 11-4. to four. There's that big gap that John Bede was mentioning to In This World at 8s, Porticello 12s, Isio 10s, Ikari Allen and Pied Piper 14s, Vauban 16s. Anything floating your boat just yet? No. It's a short answer. It's a one that I share. The morning, the morning of the triumph is time enough to have an opinion on it. You and I got involved with the triumph a long way out. Yeah, <laughs> a long way out. Beaten, last beaten twice, Shay. <laughs> So that's the end of the show and we are going to be focusing on novice hurdlers next week, giving them their full dues. We've got an exciting edition of the Tollworth Hurdle coming up, grade one at Sandown. Constitution Hill goes back there and he's up against the likes of the Cheltenham winner, Dats All Right Gino. Ruby, looking forward to that and looking forward to next week. Looking forward to seeing Constitution Hill and we have a lot of novices to talk about next week. We certainly have. So make sure you join us at the same time next week. In the meantime, if you want to catch up with the column, it's racingtv.com forward slash road to Cheltenham. But for now, it's goodbye. The home of jump racing. This is where the magic happens. Feel like a Cheltenham favourite with Paddy Power.